live brunch. We are live. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Live Brunch. Live Brunch. Live Brunch. Wow. Welcome to our last... Sorry, I just shouldn't be saying last. Welcome to our episode of Live Brunch. Um, and yeah, that starting through me. <laughs> last? No, sorry. Do you know something we don't know? I do know something that you don't know. Is the world going to end? But let's ignore what that. What is it? Is it the second now. coming? It could be. Guys, it is the second coming. <laughs> Tomorrow, what or when? Sometime between now and next week. Sometime Jesus between now back. and next Sunday. So guys, something is going to happen. Obviously, that means no more live brunch, which that, is the main thing. Yeah. Um, we could have just let that slip, and then I, I could have let it slip, but I didn't. But I'm sorry. you did. Sorry. Um, Joel, you just finished preaching to us I on uh, family. Yeah. Uh, Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Yeah. And Thank have you. you got your Father's Day presents or anything special? No. No. I no. Ha I haven't either. Haven't yet. Yes. So, wives Still and families, time. if you're watching this, we will be back home soon. Yeah. We expect we do. red carpet treatment and the Red presents. carpet. That, that would be a lovely present. Yes. <laughs> uh, Joel, so do you want to do a quick one-minute summary of... Yeah. The yeah, so it's, it's the story of Abraham and uh, uh, Sarai having a child the wrong way. So they promised a child uh, back in chapter 12, and it's a long time coming. Ten years later, there's still no child. So... Uh, they decide on a different route uh, where he, he makes his, his maidservant pregnant um, and uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not the answer. And he, um, uh, Sarah, Sarai is very upset because uh, Hagar is now treating her like she's second wife because Hagar's had the child, Sarai hasn't. And so then Sarai decides to send Hagar um, into the wilderness, which is cruel of her. Hagar is left out there pregnant in the, in the wilderness, God meets her and looks after her at a well and makes promises. And that's where the story, that's where the chapter finishes. And we just talked about, well, we talked about a lot of things, but that, that's the story. It's really about how we make dumb decisions when we don't trust God. Brilliant. You could have just said that last said that. time <laughs> and we would have been happy. But yeah. you kind of, did half to the preaching end. So. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's um, what you do. We are in the midst of our small group terms, so we've got a few questions to help you in your discussion. With the, within your small group, if you haven't signed up to a small group, we are manual.com forward slash small groups. These are just a wonderful opportunity to be in community and do life together. Uh, so here are the questions for you. Which of the characters in this story most resonates with your experience or do you find it hardest to relate to? Second question, how can we avoid the mistakes of this passage and allow God's voice to shape our households what does or could that look like for you? And then the third question, what of God's mercy and kindness do you see in this passage? Are you aware of God seeing you and how might that help you this week? And so Anna, you're gonna help us with the, the second question. Am I? Yep. What was the second question? How can, <laughs> how, how can you avoid can the mistakes of this passage <laughs> and allow God's voice to shape your household? And what could, that, yeah. what could that look like for you, yeah. Anna? Oh, yeah, Anna. No. Well, Anna. Tell us. Yeah. My mind momentarily wandered. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think first thing is, for me, I am a complete activator. I will go very quickly. I'll think of a solution, mm. and I will activate on it very quickly. Mm. And it's a great gift from God, but it, it needs a lot of God in it. Mm. Um, and so for me, it's not activating immediately it's remembering okay I don't need to come up with a solution and an answer immediately I need to come to God first and I think it's out of that place of coming to coming to God and sometimes it's coming to him and then coming to him again and then another day and then with somebody else and then with somebody else and another day that you then find that place of peace even in the situation and it's out of that place of peace that you can then start to hear God, mm. I think. For me, that's yeah. what I find. Mm. Otherwise, I'm just too quick to come up with my own solutions. And it mm. might be that those solutions were right and good, but actually, whatever the solution is, if it's done out of the wrong motivation of I'm in the driving seat and I need to solve this, mm. then that's a problem. Because mm. actually what God looks at all the time isn't necessarily our actions, it's our heart behind our actions. Mm. And so we just need to make sure that 
is right first. It's really Brilliant. good. Brilliant. Yes. Yeah. Is there any practical ways you'd say to, to ensure, that, uh, to make sure you guard your heart and you keep your heart rooted in who God is rather than letting that get distracted? I think the more time, genuinely, the more time, it sounds like a very spiritual answer, but it is, it's real. The, the more time you spend before God and the more time you spend worshipping and not worshipping navel gazing, but worshipping looking mm. at Jesus, mm. actually, the more you start to see who he is, it then reflects, you then see yourself a bit more for who you are. Yeah, Brilliant. I think. Brilliant, really, really good. Okay, so should we jump into some questions um, that we have about what Joel just preached on? So the first question, even though it's quite a bizarre story, I think a lot of people will resonate with the dysfunction of family yeah. in this passage. And in an increasingly individualistic society, establishing and maintaining a family sometimes doesn't seem to be a great priority. Is that a problem? Uh, if family can be so painful, is it worth the hassle? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is worth the hassle. Um, and it is a problem that we, we don't see it um, the way that God sees it. Um, I think that we, we do live in a, in a time in history where especially the family's kind of, it's like it's been put through um, concentrated acid. You know, it's like there's not, there's not much left over. It's kind of been disintegrated to its tiniest particles. And society is increasingly at atomized. So, um, uh, the, and the results of that are, are, are generally negative, really, in all kinds of ways. Some of the, some of the pretty disturbing results is, you know, just general kind of dysfunction and, and troubled mental health and even things like crime rates and stuff, but also um, just uh, the, the, the way in which people are poorly trained for the future and uh, we have very, very, very much less of a, um, a kind of common shared concept of covenant love. Um, we tend to uh, revert to a kind of uh, reciprocal kind of love as the only real way. You know, if, if my needs aren't being met in this relationship, then it's valid for me to abandon it, um, which is... A, which is increasingly seen as the normal way to think, even about marriage. You know, if this isn't making me happy, then uh, I, it, it, I'm kind of, it's appropriate for me to move on um, and screw the results, to be, to be frank. Um, and that's disastrous for everybody, not just for society at large, but for the individual himself, because they're making decisions that will hurt them, really. Even though, like Sarah, we might think we have a rationale you might think, well, you know, this could work out. You know, I leave my husband or I leave my wife or I, I, I just flirt with this other person. Ah, it'll work out. Mm. Um, it doesn't work out. It just doesn't. It doesn't. The stats say it. You don't need a Bible. The stats say it. Um, if, we, if, we want, you know, if we want extra information. So I, mean, I think I'm answering the question. I just think it's a, it's a definite no-go. And so part of the... I would say, you know, if someone says to me, what is, like, top three priorities for people who love Jesus in 21st century Britain, what is it we should be attending to? What is it we should be trying to achieve? Priority thing, I would say rebuilding the family, rebuilding marriages and family. Definitely in the top three, if not top two, if not top one. It's like, what could be more important? So if somebody who's watching this is having their mind blown by what you said about in terms of the, the top three, and they're saying, wait, hold on a second, I thought it's very much about uh, who I am and my identity and fulfilling the purpose that, you know, even God has for me, yeah. has planned for me. Yeah. And, and you're talking about, about family and you're talking about something else. How do you get them to reorient their thinking into seeing, no, actually, this is a lot more um, of, of priority than the individual, individualistic approach to themselves, their identity, that sort of thing? I guess, I guess I'm um, aware of how much we've kind of flipped socially without necessarily everyone sort of noticing. Mm. Um, and so, you know, that, that myth of the frog in the kettle, you know, I don't know if it's true or not, but they say, you know, if you put a frog in hot water, it jumps out, put it in cold water and gradually raise it, the frog boils because it doesn't notice until too late. Really, things have changed so much. People don't even, so Christians don't read their Bible even with that, those glasses on. They read it through the individualistic lens not realizing that in this society in which this was written, it was completely normal for people to think, a priority in my life is to lay my life down for my, my wife, or to, I'm, I'm, 
I'm not an island. I'm not. That's not I, I, and actually, that's not the best way for me to flourish as a human being in a kind of an individualistic way. Uh, to, to, uh, just to, to think following Jesus is just me and Jesus, as if I'm going to save the world, is, 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 um, is simply not very fulfilling anyway. Mm. And so, you know, I, I kind of... I delight in preaching at New Day, for example, with like 7,000 teenagers. I love preaching to them about getting married and having kids. Because no one talks like that to teenagers. Everyone talks about going and saving the world. Everyone wants to save the world, but no one wants to do the dishes. Mm. No one wants to build a community in a house. And actually, that's one of the main ways you will save the world, is by loving someone for the rest of your life and staying committed to them and raising children to do the same. What better thing could you do in the world than that? What, what, t- tell me, what could be better for the world than that? But oh, we'd rather do it, it's, it's just not glamorous. Mm. And we, we just we haven't understood some main principles. That doesn't mean that there aren't people who are called to a single... Like, that's a major caveat. We've got to be really clear about that. And I'm not emphasising that today. So that, that's for another day. That's, so don't get me wrong. That's very important. But when we, emphasize, when we kind of protect that space, we mustn't do it at the expense of the, the reality that for most people, the right thing in life will be to take this part of life very seriously. Mm. Well, actually, in... Um Genesis, when you look at the creation story, I was listening to something about this the other day, that, you know, God made this and it was very good. God made this and it was good. God made that and it was good. God made the other and it was good. God made man, it was very good. But then the first time it wasn't very good is man being on his own. Yeah. That actually Absolutely. from the very beginning, and obviously then he brought Eve and that's about husband and wife, but there's the whole thing actually that God is in relationship with himself and then he created us and we were on our own. And that ain't good. Yes. You know, God's created us from the very beginning Absolutely. to be in relationship. Brilliant. That, that's what we're created to be. That's part of our DNA as creatures. Brilliant. What's the knock-on effect that this would have on the church and community? So the, the emphasis on family. I think that, um, I mean, it's, 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 you need to ask somebody today, who are you? Um, I, I say to, I guess, particularly someone in a kind of Western context. Who, who are you? Tell me about yourself. Uh, I give, I'll give you 60 seconds to do it. Um, and then you ask the same question to someone in the Bible or, or even someone in a non-Western context today um, and the answer would be quite different. They'll talk, the answer you get from, a, from a, someone in the Bible would be, I am so-and-so, son or daughter of so-and-so, son or daughter of so-and-so. And the sense of identity with family is a huge thing. I think trying to um, cultivate that in our lives so that we feel a, a genuine, deliberate sense of connection um, with, with the people that, that we found with is, is, a, is a huge part of it. I think that when... when I guess this is a story about a, a father who abdicates, particularly. Now, not all the Bible stories are about that. In this case, it is. And very much like Adam, he abdicates his role. If he hadn't, um, it's more looking at what wouldn't have to happen. So if we say, what would be improved if, if, uh, if we built family a biblical way... In some ways, it's almost rather like looking at what, what would we not have to put up with, rather than what, you know, would we get to, the, to, the, to Mars quicker? Would we, do, would we achieve more? As a, I don't know. But there's a lot of things that we would have to put up with a lot less of if, if, if there was a kind of uh, commitment here. And I guess um, in, in, in this case, this is one example, it is the kind of active sense of spiritual responsibility that parents, and in this case, especially a father, should have felt. I would say to dads, as we come out of lockdown, I mean, I said it in the sermon, I'll say it again. Let's start praying about what it means for our family to come back to live worship. I think that dads are going to have to play quite a big part in that. I think it would be very tempting for dads to leave that to their wives Mm. uh, or to let the kids decide. And certainly there's a time in life where you do let your kids decide. Mm. But that must not be done too early. And for dads to feel like, no, I'm, I'm going to take a lead. You do it well, you do it wisely, you do it graciously, you don't thunder out the law, but you, you win people. You prayerfully win them over, say, we're going to, and you lead by example, and you, I'm, I'm going to worship God, you better come with me. And you, you're the first there, and you're singing, and your hands are up, because that's how to be a dad. And, and that kind of culture in a church turns it upside down in a moment. You have revival if, if, if dads are visibly leading in worship. Brilliant. This is really exciting. I'm looking forward to going back to church with my family. Mm. Um, we're all parents, and we know in the moment, being a dad or a mum is very hard, and it's not very glamorous or exciting or awe-inspiring. It's, 
don't touch the TV, don't touch the TV, yeah, don't touch yeah, the TV, don't yeah, push the TV yeah. over, don't touch the stove. <laughs> it, it's all of that that's just constant, constant, constant. Um, and in some ways, maybe people listening to this are like, oh, really? It sounds way more exciting to go out and change the world than to go and change a nappy or to do the dishes. Uh, and, and it's hard. Yeah. It's, it, emotionally, it is, it's yeah. hard. It's very frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. You can't see change or you don't see change the way you could probably see in the workplace. Um, you can order people to do stuff and bang, they do it. Yeah. it, it not so much at home. <laughs> uh, what would you say to, to parents who are probably hearing something like, Joel, this is hard work, man. You know, pss, I'd rather go change the world. Do you, do you oh, want to go first, um, or you? Well, I'm just thinking actually recently that some of the conversations I've been having at home are ones that are reflective of changing the world. I'm talking about um, all sorts to do with gender and sexuality, yeah. and um, you know, I want to believe in God, but it's hard and it's boring, and da -da -da, all these like real things and you know how do I have control over my mind and you know this is the stuff that actually when we're changing the world yes. with other people we're having the same conversations so but we get to do it with little ones who live with you so you right. get to do it all the time and it is does make it harder because then they won't go away but you get to mm. you get to do that and you get to influence it in a Absolutely. bigger way I think. I heard so, someone say um Godly conversations around the dinner table topple mighty empires, which is about right. It doesn't really, it, it's actually, some, one of the generals, actually, it was Napoleon or someone said it was actually the mothers that changed the world because <laughs> they're the ones that shape the future. But it is, I think that kind of, is exactly what, it's, it's that kind of vision. So mm. thinking, no, no, this, this is where the real action is. This is the real action. The other stuff is kind of icing. You know, and if it says mothers, then then that's an encouragement to dads. Don't just disappear off. Yes, 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 yes. Get there, get in those conversations, Absolutely. do the putting to bed when yes. you can have those conversations and all the rest. I, I guess actually trying to... Um, I, don't, yeah, I think doing it, with, it's like doing it with faith is the point, isn't it? Because I think what the question comes from is a kind of... It, it, it's, it feels like this isn't working, it's not, it's, it's, this isn't any good. I get that. I think the feeling of fruitlessness, the feeling of frustration, sometimes heartache, it's very real, and uh, I think it can steal our faith. And you know, whatever's not a faith is, is sin. And so coming into this whole thick journey of, I'm going to raise my kids, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this wholeheartedly, it does require faith. Um, if we just do it because cause that's the rules now, that's what the preachers are, I, I don't know how fruitful that will be. And uh, So stirring with faith, asking God for faith and a vision for it is key. Brilliant, brilliant. Mate, if, if people want to really get uh, more into this, the, the you know the, the the family being priority, the importance of the family, any resources that you recommend that they look into? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd recommend um, so many, and maybe we should put a few some in, in show notes and that sort of thing. But um, I think one one thing that I read recently that I found particular, two things that I read recently that I found very helpful. <laughs> one of them is Paul Tripp's book. Uh, I think it's just called Parenting or Parent. Gospel Center Parenting? No, it's just Parenting. Parenting, yeah, yeah. I, that's, a, that's a classic. It's a, okay. it's a really superb book. Parent, just Parenting. Paul Tripp, double P. Yeah. And the other is, um, it's called Love and Respect yeah. in the Family. Love and Respect in the Family. I can't remember the name. I think it's Egg something. Egerich. Yeah. His surname is unusual. But just Google Love and Respect in the Family or whatever Brilliant. search engine you use and get that book because it's, it's just so wise. He does a podcast so, with his son as well where they... Yeah, that's okay. gold. That's it's, brilliant. It's very, very does one for marriage and one for, yeah. for, for parenting. Just outstanding. Great. Anna, any recommendations? I would, no, not books, but I would say find families around the church who you think would do it well and see if you can get time with them. If you can't get time with them, talk to them on the phone or, you know, whatever. That's but great. I think it's actually just being inspired by yes, families yes, yes. who are doing it well, mums yes. and dads who Super. are Amen. doing it well. Um, we've only got time for probably one or two more questions. Um, you, you talked about that we shouldn't, com we, we can be prone to compromising truth for the sake of relationships. Massive, I think that is so true, especially um, you know within a, within a, as a preacher, yeah. you, know, <laughs> you could be thinking, well, um, these are the people looking in. How do I make sure that I, I don't yeah, lose yeah. a relationship with them? But even uh, on, for people who aren't preaching and who are watching this and thinking. That's a really big statement about not compromising truth for the sake of relationship because how do you actually outwork that yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis? You could, you could come into um, 
conflict with people who aren't in church, people who are in church but have different views yeah. of the Bible, also within your own family with, yeah. with different views. Just any, any practical tips on, on how you could manage that tension and, you know, speak the truth in love, I guess? Well, well, I suppose what you, the very last thing you said, speak the truth in love, is probably the, a key. Mm. Um, I think investigating what that verse, because it's in, it's in Ephesians chapter 4, that, that very phrase, speaking the truth in love. What does that mean? What does it look like? Learning to, to, to be discipled by that verse is a lifetime's work. And um, I, think, I think that's... that's it, def it defies a quick answer, really, but I would say meditate on that very thing, speaking the truth in love. It's a biblical theme. You know, Jesus is filled with grace and truth. These, these combinations are in Scripture for a reason. So learning, to, you know, seeking out, seeking God, saying, give me wisdom at how to do that. Everyone's experience will be different, and their story will be different, and it will take you in different, sometimes painful directions. But if you hold on to that commitment, Truth in love, truth in love. It's not truth without love, it's not love without truth. It's got to be that combination. And you, you prayerfully pursue it, then we're, we're on the right journey. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, I think it will all be very different for different people, how it, how it, will, how it will look. Superb. Well, our time has come to an end. I, just, I love the stuff you shared on, on family. You know, maybe we should start doing a podcast on family mm. and interview people around family, just get people to talk about it. This is an idea, I shouldn't be saying our ideas. Uh, but thanks so much for joining us for this episode of Live Lunch. We look forward to being with you next week. Tune in at 10 o'clock uh, for our live stream or sign up to one of our services. We are manual.com services and you can be with us in the room. Have a lovely weekend and happy Father's Day. <laughs> <laughs>